You're listening to Tech Recruit, a podcast that educates talent acquisition and recruitment professionals on innovation to attract talent across all industries. We're glad you're here. Welcome to the Tech Recruit Podcast. My name is Stacey Broadwell. I will be your host. And today I have Craig Fisher. He is the head of marketing for Allegis Global, and he's the organizer and founder of TalentNet. Welcome, Craig. Thank you, Stacey. How are you? I am doing very well. Thank you for asking. We are about 90 days until Tech Recruit Conference, so I wanted to have you on to talk about what you're going to be speaking about. But before I dive into that, I have some some questions for you um, because I'm very curious a little bit more about Craig Fisher, the man. Mm -hmm. And um, I want to know, tell me about your role, first and foremost, as head of marketing for Allegis. So uh, I've been with Allegis um, just over four years now. And I started with them as a uh, talent acquisition leader at one of their clients, a large software company called CA Technologies. And so I worked as an RPO uh, employee of Allegis on site with CA for two years doing employer branding and recruitment marketing. And I led that globally. Um, And my remit there was to create some case studies, prove some points, implement software, do some cool stuff, and then get out after a couple of years and start doing that for the rest of our customers. So that's what I do. In addition to being uh, head of global marketing. I also lead our internal consulting group called Ignite uh, in their uh, recruitment marketing and employer branding practices. And we help our customers solve recruiting problems. When uh, Fortune 500 company XYZ has to hire 300 tech people in a certain region over a two year period, that's a problem. I mean, if you're not really already set up, uh, how do you do that digital transformation to even have the recruiters? to recruit those kinds of folks. Uh, So we get to solve really fun problems like that for big companies all over the world. And it's a lot of fun. So that's, that's really interesting. Is that um, kind of a, um, um, an outsourcing solution? So, you know, when you're an RPO, you have various models. One of them is complete outsourcing. We take over as the entire uh, recruitment team internally and or uh, externally for a given company. Then there are blended models where there are some of the new companies uh, or the current company's um, recruitment team and then our new team blending in to help out. And then there's a, a different kind of model where we're really consulting on talent attraction, best practices, structure and organization, and helping that company um, even select software uh, for its tech stack. Uh, so there are several different ways that we do that, but the, the problem solving part is where I come in. If there doesn't exist a current solution, it could be outsourcing, it could be um, offshoring of a sourcing team, it could be um, a marketing problem where you even throw traditional marketing at it, which can be fun as well. I mean, I've done campaigns for remote parts of the US where we have to fill jobs for a factory in the middle of nowhere, and, and how do you find those folks? And it turns out you use Christian radio stations and billboards and, and gas pump advertisements, right, and text campaigns, so lots of fun things. So you and I had a conversation um, previously And actually, it's funny because when you and I first uh, spoke on the phone, you said, wow, you are just like me. You had a staffing agency Mm -hmm. and then you you started a conference. Mm -hmm. And so I always felt like you and I had this sort of like um, like affinity for each other or something. And I look up to what you've done with uh, TalentNet as just being so extraordinary. And I want to talk a little bit about that. But. Um, when you were telling me about Allegis and the RPO uh, model that it does, I, I was looking at the website and they have, they own a host, like a portfolio of really well-known brands. Right. Yeah. So Allegis group, um, as a whole is the largest staffing organization in the United States and second or third largest in the world. Right. So Allegis group owns Allegis global solutions, which is my operating company. Uh, and then it also owns tech systems and aerotech and several other operating companies that make up the Legis group. 
uh, Aerotech was the first organization um, that our founders started back in 1984, wow. uh, basically in a basement. They were cousins and, uh, you know, went on to have great success in the staffing industry, clearly. Um, I, I kind of have this thought, too, at, at the point when, when you and I first started speaking um, at that time, that um, for a staffing agency to be acquired by a huge conglomerate or a huge company and then, and then be taken under, under this umbrella company, I, I was just curious, and I don't know how, how much you've gone into this, what... What, what makes an attractive target for a, an agency to be uh, bought or acquired? Do you know so, what that looks like? I mean, like the ratio between contract versus yeah. um, permanent roles or is there, is there a formula for that that you guys look at? Yeah, I, I'm sure there is. I can't speak officially about you know, what goes through uh, our executive team's minds when they decided to acquire. Uh, any of our operating companies, but I can tell you that a lot of it is filling a niche and right place and right time, uh, right? So when we uh, acquired uh, the company that became our RPO, uh, that was you know intentional. And when we acquired Maxim Healthcare, uh, it was definitely very intentional. So these things um, generally develop in sort of a, family type of situation where we've done business with uh, the people who own the other company for a long time, or we know them, or we've, uh, you know, partnered with them. And, uh, and that's how things evolve. We, a couple of years ago, um, bought a majority stake in hiring solved. And it's because, you know, I know those guys really well. And uh, some of us uh, really like what they do. And we, you know, push to have that sort of tech solution um, that, you know, is still open to the world, but, you know, we wanted to be closer to it. And so it's, uh, it's a fun thing to be a part of a, a big company that has, um, it's privately held, but still has lots of resources. When we have to attack um, a, a project for an organization, we have our entire MSP side of the house that manages the vendor selection for tons of companies. And then we have tech systems and aerotech that we can call on to fill certain niches if we need contractors and things like that. So there's just uh, lots of ways we can go, which is fun. Uh, sorry for our listeners. What is an MSP? That's a managed service provider. And an um, RPO? Is a recruitment process outsourcing company. <laughs> just in case people need to know what those are. They, they probably know, but... Um, right. So. Oh, that's, that's, uh, that's pretty cool. So now uh, a certain stake in hiring solved and, and they're certainly doing really great things and yeah. some fantastic recognition. I actually spoke with Sean, their owner, not too long ago. We had a really good conversation and his wife does conferences. So we just had this long conversation about, uh, you know, how they're doing um, hiring conf and um, mm -hmm. you now his, his wife does the machine learning conference and kind of the differences and the challenges there. Yep. Um, and so you have been doing TalentNet now for, gosh, 10 years? Mm -hmm. 10 yeah. years. Yep. So TalentNet actually started as the first Twitter chat for recruiters. Mm -hmm. And at the time, uh, I owned a staffing firm called A-List Solutions. And uh, we started this Twitter chat, not really for any sort of means of um, profit or gain. It was really... Um, there's a little bit of brand recognition in it for me, I guess, uh, starting it, but it was really more of a knowledge transfer um, and a way that we could disseminate some of the ideas that I was developing and utilizing and having success with and that I knew some of my friends were too. Um, we had had a recruiting chat on recruitingblogs.com for years, um, but when everyone moved over to Twitter, it kind of dissolved. Marin Hogan had been running it. Uh, and so... We, we moved it over to Twitter. I called it TalentNet, and we went through a couple of different hashtags. It was first TNL to be shorter. First it was TalentNet, then TNL, TalentNet Live, and then back to TalentNet because TNL got usurped by some weird stuff. And, uh, and from that, um, you know, was the genesis of my consulting business. So I was already doing this 
side hustle stuff as I was still running my um, staffing firm. We were getting a lot of these jobs where companies wanted us to come in and teach them how to do some cool things. And I always said that if you teach a customer how to do what you're doing, they'll still pay you to do the biggest part of that because it seems too hard at that point, <laughs> even if you just taught them how to do it. So the consulting was a real thing. And while we're on the Twitter chat one night, um, it's uh, 2008 or 2009, someone said, I really don't have any money to uh, go to an ERE, which had just started, or uh, uh, an HR technology conference or a SHRM conference. Yeah. So, you know, what, you know, I wish I could. And at the time, if, we had, if we'd had the term FOMO, that would have been a big deal right then. But somebody said, look, you've got all these great people right in the Dallas area. Why don't you start your own conference? And that's how TalentNet started. And so, so we, we decided to put our own thing together near South by Southwest? Well, so what happened was we started in Dallas and we decided that uh, we'd, we'd, we'd test it out. So myself and Chris Hoyt and Jim Schneider and a few other people, um, you know, tested out the Dallas market. We hosted at uh, PepsiCo's Frito-Lay headquarters and uh, it was a big success. And so right away we decided that we'd try it in a few other places. So we hosted one in San Antonio. Uh, we hosted one in Chicago. Uh, we hosted one in Austin. We hosted one in London. We hosted a few and um, kind of went all over the world. And uh, we, we ended up going back to Austin on a regular basis on the first day of South by Southwest because a lot of the cool tech that we were working with, including things like Twitter and Foursquare, uh, we're debuting at the South by Southwest conference on a regular basis. So we go there and host in the middle of sort of tech central in Austin on the first day of South by. And very quickly, the South by founders got used to us and said, okay, well, you can use the word South by Southwest in your advertising because you're the only full day of recruiting uh, content at South by, which is great. And so now we host at Whole Foods Market headquarters every year um, in uh, in Austin in the spring uh, at South by and then in the fall we host in Dallas at another big employers headquarters and this year on December 6 we'll be at Toyota's headquarters which will be really cool. Wow I yeah. hadn't realized that you were in so many different locations mm -hmm. do you guys still uh, move it around as much? We get asked to sometimes and uh, it, it's a one-off situation. We've been st uh, very steady on the fall conference in Dallas, that's called TalentNet Live, uh, and the spring conference in Austin, TalentNet Interactive, for several years now. But occasionally we get asked to do other things and I'm actually starting to branch off into some more business type conferences as well. So you'll hear more about that pretty soon. I, I feel like I've seen some teasers um, and I don't know if like it not I don't know if you're developing in them, but maybe just that you're speaking at video conferences and things of I that. I am speaking at Video Marketing World this year. Um uh, so a friend of mine, uh, a few friends of mine were speaking at this conference last year, Video Marketing World. And because I speak at so many conferences, I don't really have time to go just attend a conference. Um and this thing called Video Marketing World showed up at a big um, hotel right down the road from where my house is last year in the middle of August where I didn't have anything going on. And I said, you know, it's not very expensive. What the heck? I'm going to go check it out. A couple of my friends are speaking. I checked it out and I'm like, man, this is great because this is a lot of the stuff that I'm doing. And I really think this applies to recruiting. And so since then, I've been talking a lot um, sort of all over the country about video for uh, you know, job advertising and video for job marketing and, and job branding and employer branding and uh, talent attraction and culture branding and, you know, all this stuff. So there's so many areas where video applies and we should be doing it better. So I'm really excited to this summer have been asked to speak at Video Marketing World um, in 2019. So that's, Kind of a great segue because you spoke at LAX Tech Recruit, 
Orange County Tech Recruit in November. Mm -hmm. And your topic was on employer branding and, and humanizing your employer brand. Right. And you opened up your discussion about who you are as a person and before you walked into the key points. And um, at this conference, you're going to be at LAX Tech Recruit July 18th. You're going to be talking about video and employer branding and how um, companies can can be better about utilizing that. You want to talk a little bit about what you're going to speak about? Yeah. So um, the message is still right. Be human and mm -hmm. video really helps you humanize your company's culture. Any job descriptions that you've got out there in the world. If you have someone doing the job, talking about how they like the job, um, what they do all day, a day in the life, uh, that is so many, at least seven times more believable than just words on, on paper, right? Um, we have also got some stats that say um, graphics, photos of employees or videos in an actual job advertisement increase the believability and click-through rate of the job ad. There's lots of evidence of that now. Um, and we also have all these great sort of do-it-yourself um, video vendors out there uh, for recruitment, helping you um, give people the tools to do it themselves all over your company. So there are so many different ways that you can effectively use video to enhance your employer brand and attract talent to your organization. And I've kind of put it all together in a step-by-step, -step, here's what you do for each platform format. And uh, we'll kind of run through the, the fast version of that at, uh, in, in LA in uh, July. Yeah. July? Yeah, July 18th. July 18th, right. Right after the 4th of July. I made sure to get everybody after they came back from vacation from 4th of July. It was very strategic on my part. I like it. <laughs> I'll wear my um, so it's really interesting because you hear so much about video, not only in like on a career site, but also in um, in Facebook ads and um, in Instagram and um, social media, just in general across the board, that right. the algorithms will favor a video um, over just a, a static ad. Right, they will, and. So if you know me, you see me going live a lot and I post a lot of video. Um, I do a lot of video ads for my conferences and for, uh, you know, behind the scenes for our clients and our jobs and things like that. Uh, and so um, I, I show up in, uh, you know, sort of the video marketing of employers all over the place that is I'm an admin to let's say, I don't know, 70 Facebook pages or something ridiculous like that. Um, but it's critical to, yeah, it's critical to get that right. Um, in fact, an animated GIF is more effective than a flat up video for a Facebook ad in a lot of situations. There's lots of nuance to it. Um, a video post in LinkedIn is 20 times more likely to get shared than a post without video. Um, it's the most popular form of post uh, on LinkedIn right now, and it gets by far the most engagement. So there are lots of stats that I'll bring to this that are fun and informative, and uh, you'll learn a lot. Are, why so many, uh, why are your admins on so many pages? What are those pages? So the pages are all corporate pages. So I've got, you know, let's say, uh, a couple of Craig Fisher pages and several conference pages. And then I'm an admin on the Allegis Global Solutions page. And then I'm an admin on a number of company pages that, you know, we do the recruitment marketing and employer branding for. Um, there's just a bunch. And then, you know, I have a whole consulting business still where I'm an admin for all of those companies. And uh, so, yeah, it just ends up that way. And then nobody ever takes you off as an admin once you're at it because they just don't think to do it. So I, I looked the other day and it's, it's a lot. <laughs> so are you managing also your, your, uh, the business manager within Facebook? Yeah, I have a, you know, I use both ads manager and business manager a lot through my phone because to be honest, it's, it's much easier to to work with. Also, you know, a little secret. Um, if you do your ads starting with Instagram, it's way easier to configure than going straight to Facebook. 
Um, and then it will automatically post through to Facebook if you have the settings right. So there are all kinds of, um, you know, strategic nuances to building Facebook ads that could be a whole nother presentation because I, I do a ton of that. You know, it's interesting. I had a conversation, um, I believe it was last week with our own, um, um, I guess he's our social media manager. Um, he helps us with our ads um, in just in a consulting sort of way, but just on the affinity portion of it and um, looking at your different segments and your targets and trying to understand the affinity marketing, like what brands or, um, you know, words or um, ideas that they connect with. And one of the things he said to me, um, he, he had these, uh, just kind of like these um, ad words and keywords written down in certain segments. And one was for wearables, like uh, internet of things and uh, wearable technologies. And um, he said, yeah, this is a great segment to market to because they have all kinds of money. <laughs> I just, it's true. I hadn't even considered yeah. that before. Yeah, and, and, <sighs> Coffee is another big one. Um, there, there are several uh, sort of niche markets that you should absolutely be marketing to. And I started doing this, building these lists, uh, you know, eight, nine, ten years ago um, for for advertising there. And it's gotten easier, um, and it's also gotten harder at the same time because Facebook took away some of the functionality recently. Um, uh, you know, the way you're able to target people, but it, it's funny on, um, YouTube, I use these tools, uh, TubeBuddy and VidIQ to help me determine what keywords and, um, themes I should have in the description of my videos on YouTube. And, uh, I don't know if it's just the way I look and I think it is, but it's constantly telling me to use keyword Jimmy Kimmel, um, on everything that I post. So I'm like, all right, I can do that. And it works. Oh, that's, that's so interesting because um, does it actually tell you which keywords are getting the most hits? It does. And with these tools, you can also see which of your competitors' videos uh, are using keywords and, and all the keywords they're using. So it's fascinating stuff. So that is ToolBuddy and BitIQ? TubeBuddy. Oh, Tube. And vid IQ, V I D IQ. Uh, thank you. I'm gonna I'm gonna have to check those out because um, we certainly have a lot of videos that I have ten years worth of videos for uh, my CTO roundtables that mm -hmm. we we do. Um, okay, so that's that's a uh, really interesting. That's what you're gonna be talking about, kind of the video and how to market that and how that is important for your employer brand. Do you think mm -hmm. that for companies to to develop that brand utilizing video is difficult? Is that something a hurdle that they have to somehow overcome? No, um, the reality is you don't have to be an expert at video marketing to get started, just start, right? Take videos of your employees, and, and here's the reason why. Uh, an employee, a normal employee's view of their organization is not the entire organization. So you don't have to have a video that encompasses every different um, you know, group in your company. And it doesn't have to cover every different region of the world. Just do something specific about a job category or a specific job and have one or two people who do that job talk about the job. A person's view of an organization is like this. It's not, it's not everything. It's their immediate coworkers and their immediate supervisors. So have people doing the job, talk about the job, get that stuff on your career site so it's accessible. Put it on Glassdoor so that when people go look at your awful reviews, they can at least see people currently doing the job saying, yeah, this is actually really great and here's why. Um, utilize that ability to put people in front of people and you can have easy wins. That is a win right there, what you said about Glassdoor. I don't know how often I have that conversation with companies when they say, we're trying to battle this reputation that we've um, somehow achieved <laughs> on Glassdoor because it's just, I mean, when people are upset, they're more likely to write a review. Right. 
And that is a great, I, I mean, one company suggest, uh, said that they, they took it head on and they just, uh, um, they answered each one of the reviews mm -hmm. and that helped their score. It does um, help. But putting that video, that's a great idea, Craig. Yeah, and you can refresh your content on Glassdoor as often as you want. So I suggest putting new content there every week or every two days um, so that then you end up with a library of people talking about the jobs that you're advertising there. Um, the other thing is Glassdoor is, it, it is what it is. If you're paying for your, to own your profile, you're in better shape because your competitors aren't advertising on your page there, right? I mean, I'm all about the advertising. This is sort of my gig. Um, but at the same time, uh, there are a lot of different strategies. Not every company can answer every review and, and doesn't want to address them. And we'll never get that overcome or, or passed by their executive team. So, you know, you have to attack it in different ways. One of those ways is have better conversations with your employees on the way out the door. I mean, think about it. It's as simple as that. If your last interaction is terrible, what are you going to do? You're going to go torch people. But if your last interaction is more of a thank you and we appreciate you, you're less likely to do so. Yeah, that, that's actually crucial. Is there, for, for these um, job videos, is there a certain um, suggestion as, as far as like how long they should be? I mean, you know, we talk about people who have a um, attention deficit disorder or like that attention right. span um, because of social media. Um, is there a certain length that is recommended? So the old rule used to be three minutes and under, and that's, that's pretty long now in these days of, you know, uh, Instagram videos need to be 15 to 30 seconds. Um, so you don't have much time. And so I say, create videos that you can use in any medium. I say 15 and 30 seconds is, uh, are great times for videos. Now, that said, Facebook actually gives more credence to people who stick around and watch longer videos. So those videos get credit for the people that don't bounce out soon enough because it takes a real commitment to stay with that video. And so the reason that video gets a little higher rank is because it's gotta be a better video. It's got to be good enough for people to want to watch it. And so if it is and it's longer, you do get credit for that. So great question. What makes uh, a great video? Is it mm -hmm. that it's touching? Mm -hmm. In your opinion, what, what makes for those great videos? So we know from things like uh, the Candidate Experience Awards and from uh, research by companies like The Muse that uh, the hottest topic for young job seekers right now is not salary, right? It's absolutely um, about prestige uh, of the job that they're doing and who they're doing it for. And part of that is the way the company contributes to their community. And so build a sense of community and giving back, have a good message, have some fun, uh, I'll show a great Warby Parker video um, when I'm there for your event that is very short but hilarious. Uh, and there, there are a few different formats, right? But if you're, if you're trying to attract a certain type of person, there's a certain type of message that you need to give. So I've often, well, last year, I saw a lot of these uh, videos where it's, you know, the CEO walking through his uh, office and, and he, you know, he's catching boxes that say, join us, right. diversity, empowerment. Right. And, and I just thought those were like the most awesomest videos. And when we were at um, my conference in uh, November, the Orange County Tech Recruit Conference that you attended, mm -hmm. I tapped you on the shoulder. And I said, Craig, I want to do one of those employer branding, throw me a box, Ask videos. What do you say? And you're like, let's do it. <laughs> right. Yeah. You, you don't need a whole lot of preparation. Hey, how did that video turn out by the way? It's great. Is it's it? on, it's on our sizzle reel actually, Craig. You check it out. All right. You're in it. You're, you're, so the only thing that I probably would have done differently is that we did it during the lunch break, if you mm -hmm. recall. And so there was no one in the room. Right. <laughs> so it just looked like, 
it was the speakers all lined up and me walking through them. I think we did two takes and yeah. the one we ended up using in the video was take one. All right. Excellent. Well, there you go. I, so I, I feel like um, overly scripted videos are fine, but not necessary. You don't need a big budget to get this right. Um, just have some fun and then do some good editing and, and production. I think that's, that's kind of the key, right? When it feels like it's authentic, because mm -hmm. when we went out there, we just kind of did it off of a whim, like the, the vibe felt really good. Let's capture this right now. And right. I think people pick up on it. Like you said, if it sounds really scripted and if it doesn't sound authentic, um, that tends to come through. Yeah, I agree. And it, I, I'll turn a video off in a heartbeat if it just seems wooden and, and scripted. Now, the other thing that you want to remember is um, you know, make sure that you have the words that people are saying transcribed onto the video. Um, because there's a huge percentage, 89% or something, of videos on Facebook and YouTube and other places that are watched with no sound. So if you want to reel people in, there have to be words like literally typed onto the video. Mm. I've got tricks for that. Okay. YouTube? Mm -hmm. YouTube does transcriptions. It does? Yep. Um, and then Lumen, if you wanted to make something. Mm -hmm. um, Camtasia does it as well. We use Camtasia. I haven't done the words on that. Works pretty um, well. Is that like in the, I, I know you have like the library up there. Mm -hmm. um, do you remember which part it's in? Like yeah, in so that? if you're looking at your left hand um, yep. menu, you mm -hmm. have to scroll down and it'll, it'll have transcription. Oh, <gasps> what? You have to set it up. You have to talk to it for a while <laughs> and, uh, and, and get your voice um, known to the algorithm, but then, once you do that, it works pretty good, and um, it puts it on all the right frames and things like that. Craig, I've learned so much in just our conversation, just in how to optimize your videos on on Facebook, on YouTube. Those those tools that you suggested are are outstanding, and yeah. then also just like that Camt. I've been using Camtasia since we started the podcast, which was really only in January. Thank you, Jim Stroud, for helping me push that forward. Yeah. And, um, and he suggested great, Camtasia. And yeah. I had no idea there was a trans. I've been doing it the hard way. Mm -hmm. Oh, thank you so much for that. Jim and I have been using Camtasia since, uh, almost since it first came out. <laughs> That's a long time. He, when I first spoke with Jim Stroud, Mm -hmm. I probably, we had our initial conversation and I think we sat on the phone for two hours and I had four pages of notes and he just kind of helped me get myself started with uh, the podcast and mm -hmm. our newsletter and just ways we could market it and advertise it. And he's just, we, we talk still all the time and he's just kind of been such a support supporter and an advocate of what I'm doing. I mean, there's, there's certainly certain people in the industry who've just really gotten behind this new kid on the block and, and just supported it. And, and you're one of those. And I, and I just thank you. You're welcome. And congratulations. We're excited to have you around. <laughs> I know. Cause I'm not going anywhere. No. <laughs> um, there you go. So LAX tech recruit in July. And then we're doing Chicago in September. Were you going to be attending Chicago as well? I think I am. <gasps> yes. Because um, Chicago, I've never been to Chicago. Mm. And you said you've done a conference there. Yeah, several. Okay. And you asked, you suggest that I reach out to Star Chicago. Mm -hmm. And Matt Jones is going to partner with us to right. co-market. And we're there partnering with Disrupt HR. Lou Adler is going to be there. And it was actually Lou Adler's idea. <laughs> Lou's like, I want to go to Chicago. I want to go to New York. And, you know, he's just making a list of all the places where he wants to go have a conference. And I'm just Good like, for oh. him. That's great. <laughs> yeah. And that's, and that's the way to do it. It's so 
the way I've always felt about it is if there's a, a reason to go, not just, not just I want to make a bunch of money, but you've got another reason to go. Somebody's pushing you or it's a reason you want to be there that that's the way it should organically grow. And you know, what, what happens will end up being a cadence over time and you won't notice it until it's happened a few times. And you're like, this is kind of our cadence now. And, and it just works out. Well, that's good to hear. I, I know that when I've had some key questions about things I've reached out to and you've been very helpful in kind of moving me forward on things. Well, I'll tell you that if, uh, if Lou Adler's into it, I'm into it. So I, I'm all on board. Are you a Lou Adler fan? Sure, of course. Who isn't? I know. When I first when I first spoke with Lou and he said he was going to keynote our very first event, my the phone almost dropped because he's been in the industry for so long. I, I've been in recruiting for 10 years, but I just this is my first time venturing into the conference space. And really it was because I needed to upskill. I wanted to know what the new technologies and the innovations were and what other people are doing because I got trained at Robert Half, which Fortune 500 company, best training ever, hands down, but it was 10 years ago. Mm -hmm. And I didn't want to sit on YouTube. I didn't want to be have sales you know, pitches. And to hear from industry experts such as yourself and Lou Adler and Dean DaCosta, um, I thought to myself after putting these together and having all these speakers, like, why aren't more people coming to these? I mean, they're essential. They're essential to, because where else are you going to get learning like that in such a condensed, quick way in one day? Yeah. Well, and it, it's, it's hard. I mean, um, it's, you know, even I have to go listen to some people speak sometimes. Right. And because I can't consume enough podcasts and uh, and webinars to even get the knowledge that I need. And I'm a quick learner and I'm already on top of a lot of this stuff. But I've got to refresh. You know, I've got to sharpen my saw on a regular basis as well, just like everyone else should. But it's just tough to make the time. And so, you know, I, I suggest to anyone thinking about attending a conference, think of it like this as an investment in yourself. It's not just networking, it's not just new tools, but it's that combination of both things that will take your career in, you know, well into the future. How much time is it going to save you at some point when you're really cranking away for a customer on a specific job or a project? Um, just knowing some of the shortcuts that you know, people like Lou and I take to get from A to B, um, you, know, you could save yourself days and that's worth you know, whatever couple hundred bucks you're going to spend on uh, going to spend the day, you know, listening and learning. Craig, we do a survey after our conference and you are one of the highest rated speakers at right. our event. And people were just like, I learned so much. It was outstanding. And um, so I'm so excited that you're coming back um, to LA and you're going to be joining us in Chicago. I was curious Along your way and your journey, has there been certain people who you consider to be mentors? Yeah, I mean, uh, a whole lot of people. But I'll just say uh, Jerry Crispin has done a ton for me. Um, John Sumser, William Tincup, um, Kevin Wheeler. I mean, a, a whole lot of people. And so it's been a I learned from everyone. I mean, even the people that I mentor, I learned from, right? So there's the list could go on and on and on, but uh, I'll stop there in the essence, in the, uh, in the uh, flavor of having a, a listenable webcast. Here. <laughs> um, so on, on the conference, I'm, I'm kind of curious about your experience in your, in your conference um, 10 years of experience. You've probably had some, you've, I imagine lots and lots of speakers and you've probably learned and as, as have I, um, what do you, and you don't have to name names or whatever, but have you had some absolute like, uh, speaker fails? Oh yeah, of course. Um, and one of the things that I've always done is try to spot talent and give new people a try. Mm -hmm. And sometimes they've never spoken at a conference before. And there are several notable industry 
people who are popular speakers now that had their first speaking opportunity at TalentNet. Because of that, and because I'm willing to do that, there are absolutely going to be some people that just don't have it together yet, right? They may have a good message, but they don't have speaking experience. And um, there are so many mistakes you can make uh, when, when you're on stage, right? You can sort of talk to yourself. You can drone on and on. You can not take cues from the audience. And, uh, you know, I'm glad that I sometimes get to coach people on, you know, how to make those presentations better. But then again, I, you know, I'm willing to give someone plenty of leeway and I don't give a whole lot of direction um, for my event. I try to hook up with smart people and, and, you know, just give them some guidelines and say, I'm, I'm going to let you do your thing, go for it. So because of that, TalentNet is uh, wildly successful. Um, but occasionally we do have some, uh, some folks that just don't quite hit the mark, but that, that's okay. You know, everybody deserves a, a second chance and they generally get it if they're persistent about it. So on the flip side, what mm -hmm. have been some of the stellar, knock it out of the park, memorable, wow, that presentation was amazing? So uh, this, is, this is funny. So Jim Durbin and I have been doing stuff together for several years now, ever since he moved to Dallas. And I have him come speak at all my conferences. And, you know, he's a good friend of mine. Um, and, and he's always had a good message. He's real smart. He puts some really wild ideas out. He's good with tools. Um, but this last uh, spring in Austin, he did a presentation on how to recruit recruiters. And so it's not just thinking like a recruiter, but thinking like a recruiter of recruiters. And so how smart do you have to be to do that? And it was really well put together, really well done. Um, I was so impressed. Uh, one year, uh, Lars Schmidt and Amber Vertesi uh, were at TalentNet and launched um, the HR open source uh, movement. So that was literally uh, a, a, a watershed moment because after that, we've had all these great case studies uh, for the last four or five years uh, pouring into HR open source and helping people out on a regular basis. But they they announced that they were going to start that uh, at that event, which was really cool. Um, I've had celebrities like uh, professional football players come and do fireside chats with me uh, at TalentNet, which I really, really loved. Um, I got to have uh, Stacey Zapar come and be uh, do her first ever uh, presentation at a TalentNet, and she was wildly good. So some, some really fun stuff over the years. Explain to me what HR open source is. So uh, HR open source uh, is a movement where um, corporations, large and small, and practitioners um, volunteer case studies of things that they've accomplished with specific guidelines around why we did it, what the problem was, how we solved it, what the statistics were, what the outcomes were, what the failures were, and what the wins were. And they're really great. Uh, and you can find the HROS page on Facebook. And I believe it's HROS.co on, uh, online. That is, I can see how that, that's so useful because I think, you know, those are the type of things that when uh, we have speakers up, I always tell my speakers, I, case studies are, are something I feel like our audience really wants to hear, you know, yes, you like this tool and, but how has, um, how have you utilized it? What have been the successes or the ROIs on that? And so we really try to kind of like hone in on that. So, yeah. um, what a useful yeah. tool. Yeah. And, and that was started by Amber and Lars. Um, and Lars and I had worked with Amber at Hootsuite. She was the, uh, uh, head of people at Hootsuite, and we'd done some strategy work uh, with her team. And she had been coming to the TalentNet conferences, and um, you know they decided they were going to, you know, create this movement. And it, it's been really amazing. And and now uh, people like Robin Schooling and Bill Borman are on the new board to help take it forward. I was one of the original board members, um, but we've got this new board. And fun fact about Bill Borman doing this, he's very passionate about it and is taking it to new levels. Um, he is celebrating 10 years of his true conference this year 
and I'm celebrating 10 years of the Talent Net conference this year, which he, he started true after he had his first ever American speaking appearance at Talent Net uh, all those years ago at the Frito Lay uh, PepsiCo headquarters. So you guys should do something together. Well, we're working on that. Um, he, he actually came out to celebrate uh, last year um, with us. Uh, he was a little early, but uh, you know, he, he came to the event last year, so it was fun. Wow. And we were together all the time. I mean, if you, if you go to any major HR technology conference, you'll see me and Bill hanging out for sure. Yeah, I, I feel like uh, when I've seen the other conferences posted and there's, you know, there's certainly um, yourself and, the, and your gang that you, you tend to hang with. And there is I, a gang, I yeah. Bill, It's a good gang. <laughs> you guys go back deep. There's deep roots. Everybody supports each other. Um, Absolutely. Everybody's just been very welcoming, and um, this conference has just been just such a great experience. And um, I can only hope that it could get to the point where you're at. So, um, you know, conference goals. And um, so, final question before I let you go: um, Where are you sitting on any other boards, or are you just with Allegis and TalentNet, or do you are you on boards other places? Yeah, I'm on the uh, uh, Candy Awards uh, Committee, um, so I sit in, on the, the Candy Board and uh, HRO Today and, you know, things like that. So sort of industry things, I'm on a lot of those boards. And then um, I'm a, on the Board of Advisors to a slew of tech companies and startups um, all over the place. Okay. And if anybody wants to get hold of you, Mr. Craig Fisher, how mm -hmm. can they do that? You can go to craigfisher.info, which will also take you to fishdogs.com. Fish Dogs Media is the uh, media agency through which I do some of my stuff. And uh, it's a talent net LLC company. So we got all these DBAs going on. Uh, you can also find out about the talent net conference at talentnetlive.com. And, um, Get your tickets early for that one. That's going to sell out quick at uh, Toyota. We'll have 300 plus people at uh, Toyota's headquarters in December. Wow, that'll be really exciting. Yeah. And uh, and of course, they can see you in Los Angeles at LAX Tech Recruit uh, July 18th. Yeah. And, and uh, I'm on Twitter and Instagram at Fish Dogs. What was Fish Dogs from? I know there you have you have dogs and you go fishing. It was kind of like that. Um, years ago when I tried to get my first uh, URL, maybe not my first, but I tried to get craigfisher.com circa 1999 to um, build my first blog. Uh, somebody had already taken it. It was owned by a famous artist in New York and uh, he's still alive. Unfortunately, no, I shouldn't say unfortunately. He's still alive. I, so I can't, I haven't been able to grab it yet. Um, but uh, I'm in line. But at the time, I was starting to write about things that were innocuous, not about recruiting and not about um, jobs, but things that I just thought techies who I was trying to recruit might be into. And I did some research and it turned out a lot of them either blogged about dogs or cats or, you know, other things, trains or biking or hiking, you know, whatever, they would write about stuff that wasn't just technology. And so I started a blog about, it was Craig Fisher and his dogs. So it was fishdogs.com is what I was able to get. I was looking into the future thinking it needs to be short and it needs to be something that no one's going to try to take. <laughs> and so I, I ended up with all this great SEO uh, for it. Turns out people search on fish dogs and I get a lot of hits to my website. So um, I've just kept it. Okay. Well, thank mm -hmm. you so much for being part of the Tech Recruit Podcast. And we'll look forward to seeing you in Los Angeles. You have a great day. Thanks, Stacey. Bye. Bye.